Hey everyone. So let's start with part one of our meetup. My name is Ankit Kare, and I'm an AI technologist at Abacus.ai, formerly Reality Engines. We recently rebranded re and came under general availability. So I welcome you all. So a brief overview of how this meetup will look like. So it will be approximately like two hours in which the first hour will be mine, where I will take on explainability in ML models. And then after that, uh, at the end, we will take your questions and then I'll hand over to Yash, who will explain some latest advancements in debiasing ML models. So I hope it sounds good. And with that, let's get started. So anybody would like to confirm everything looking clear, sound, video, please do that in the chat for me. Okay. So with that, let's get started. Okay, so let's start. So as already mentioned, uh, the title is Explainability in ML Models. So with the, the nature of AI in industry as well as most of academia right now is mostly concerned with machine learning. So that's why when we talk about explainability, the field has advanced quite a bit, but only in the world of machine learning. So with that, let's, going, let's get going with uh, why, at the first place, we need explainability? So first thing, first thing is that we all come from a very different and diverse background. And uh, that is particularly applicable to the world of machine learning, owing to the nature of it, that it's, it's getting involved in a lot of varieties of different domains. And that's why it becomes very important to, to be able to have that acquainted in the sense that uh, to, to be able to get people from other backgrounds to be able uh, to understand more and more of ML. So with that in mind, explainability in ML systems becomes even more important. And you can intuitively guess that with explainability, when you have some sort of explanations for some sort of complex deep learning based model in front of you, then it would be it would be quite easy for you guys to, to be able to gauge in what the model might be doing. What is the line of reasoning that the model might be, uh, might be going through? And that will become very clear in the, uh, in the long run, in the, in the subsequent slides where I would be uh, showing you quite a lot of examples on how uh, these explanations work wonders for people, both for machine learning practitioners, engineers, and any other people coming from other backgrounds who have limited knowledge of machine learning. Second is debugging. So for particularly machine learning engineers, debugging is quite hard. I mean, you might have heard about a CMM, content, a capability, maturity model. So level four, level five, it's kind of very popular in the world of software engineering. But have you ever heard about something like that in the world of machine learning? So what I'm trying to imply here is in the world of machine learning, it's even harder to keep track of what's your maturity of the pipeline, of the ML pipeline that you might have established in your organization. So that's where explainability plays a huge role in trying to uh, help developers and get a context of what their model might be doing and where it might be lacking. Third is the reasoning behind decision making, as, just, as I just mentioned. So when you get an output, a lot of times it becomes very uh, important to have like a clear line of reasoning behind behind making that final out decision or prediction. And 
I'll give you a, a very good example in the uh, coming slide shortly, and that will be concerned with a bank loan, where a guy is trying to take a loan and then how it matters, the explainability of the model and the sanctioning of the loan. And that also becomes a legal obligation in that particular context, right? Like you cannot just go on saying that, hey, I cannot give you a loan just because some black box model magically predicted that. And then final is the data labeling. So better data labeling means better machine learning models that are gonna be subsequently trained and a lot of other uh, advancements going faster. So that's why uh, uh, explainability in ML models also helps uh, that data labeling in, in a variety of ways. And that will again become very clear once I illustrate it with examples. So let's get going with this. So this was uh, something that I was mentioning where a guy, John, is trying to take a loan from some bank. So as a customer, he demands a loan and then the machine learning model takes in all of his data and finally gives a conclusion with the probability uh, with some probability that, hey, there's a 55% chance that John won't be able to come up with monthly repayments. So that's why we should not grant him loan. Is that enough? Obviously not, right? Even the manager should ask the question that, hey, uh, why are we not sanctioning him the loan, right? So this why, you can't just go on and then say, hey, our AI did some magic and I'm very firm that it's right. So you have to have some sort of reasoning behind that. And that's where explainability becomes very critical and crucial. With this, I would jump to this trade-off. You might have already heard about the bias and, vari bias and variance trade-off in the world of machine learning. But in this dimension of explainability in ML models, interpretability and accuracy, these are the two areas of trade-off that we have to take care of. So when the model becomes complex, it automatically is kind of less accurate. Uh, sorry, more accurate, but less explainable. And for simple models, they're quite in themselves explainable, but they're not that accurate in practice as we see in the industry. So that's why since we also need explainability behind the final line of, uh, behind the final decision that we are trying to make, we, tr we try to like uh, put some effort in trying to develop new and new, newer and advanced, uh, more advanced methods for, for coming up with some model that can produce some sort of explainability for these complex models. So note that the complex models I highlighted here, because for a simple model, a lot of times it's pretty intuitive, so we don't need explainability. But for a complex model, it's hard to even come up with any sort of idea of what it might be doing uh, a lot of times. So that's why an explicit model of explainability comes in very handy. So the whole idea of research is to make that line go a little up where complicated models like, like the one, deep, uh, like any deep learning based model, uh, we kind of have a, a better explainability. Obviously they have a better performance. So all we care about is raising the explainability along with that could, that could go along with that uh, performance. And for simple models like linear models or decision trees, as you already know, their form is quite intuitive. So explainability is already high intrinsically without training any explicit explainability model. So this is a diagram that I just kept to, to give you a hint on what, what a model might, a complex model might look like on the inside. So this is nowhere near the actual picture. It's, it's actually a very oversimplified f f uh, picture or depiction of what an actual machine learning complex machine learning or deep learning model might look like. But with the right part, we are, I'm actually trying to lay a ground on how explainability start, works in there. So with explainability, the fundamental principle is that we care about the input values and the output values one by one, not taking all of them into consideration. So that's how we start training features and attributing those features uh, uh, on the basis of one single input and output pair, and then on the, on another input and output pair, and finally trying to train a model using these input and output values to, to be able to uh, assign each feature their importance values, and then finally come up with some sort of explanation for the entire model. 
So as I already mentioned, on the left, you see a decision tree and it's quite intuitive on its own. But on the right, we have something like a deep learning model where uh, it would be extremely hard without explainability to even gauge what might be the line of reasoning behind the decision or prediction it makes. So with this, let's start with the explain explainability methods themselves. There are three basic methods that I'm discussing, that I'm going to discuss with you all. SHAP, LIME, and ANCHORS. So one thing to keep in mind, all three, uh, to, my, to, to most, of your, most of you people's surprise, they all kind of are based on the same principles. So that's what I'll be doing here. First, laying down the basic ideas behind these three explainability methods, and then substantiating it them further. Them further. Feature attribution. Uh, as I said, what we do is we take in one single input value and one single corresponding output value, and then we try to train the model, which is essentially a block box. Uh, I mean, I'm not talking about the original ML complex, complex deep learning model. I'm talking about the explainer model here. So we are trying to train uh, an explainer model, which is taking all these input-output pairs that are going to the original complex model and trying to come up with the feature importances for each, uh, for, for, for each such feature, one by one, like taking them into consideration one by one and tuning itself so that it can finally predict the feature importance, importances quite right. So in the, in, in the machine learning world, this is the basic uh, idea behind training most of the models, right? You give it like a lot of data inputs and then a lot of labels corresponding to the, that input, and that's how you train a model. Uh, you get a working model for that sort of data set, uh, which, tell, which kind of identifies the basic underlying patterns within that data and then gives you a reasonable prediction for some unseen data. So that is, that is how it works with explainability, nothing else. The basic idea remains the same. But the only difference is the classifier, the original complex model, that remains untouched. We still are treating that as a black box. And here, in addition to that old complex original model, we are training a new explainer model that is giving you feature importances now. So with that very high level idea, I think you know the, the, the very basic underlying principle. And now I would want to go ahead and dig a di uh, bit deeper to explain you the form of all those uh, functions that are operating under the simple explainability model that I referred to earlier. So this left-hand side form, the form of linear model, it's, it's pretty easy to understand because of the nature of the form itself. There are some sort of inputs going in, and then it's getting averaged to produce some output. And with that, we have some definitive weights assigned to those input values that can easily be calculated and then easily be uh, uh, gauged. Like you can easily uh, derive the importances in this simple form, right? But then when this black box is take, uh, when this black box is introduced in the middle, then things become quite crazy. And, and then we have to like, in order to tack tackle with this craziness, we have to introduce some new form. So what people did was they came up with this sort of form, where they assigned fee values, which is basically a function, on each input value. And then that's what the task of new machine learning model becomes now, to, to credit these feature, uh, to, to attribute these features to the final outcome, right? Like, what is this feature's importance for this uh, in the whole black box model, in the original black box model? So that becomes the task of this new explainable, explainability model that we want to introduce now. So with that, I will jump back to the same example where John was trying to get his loan sanctioned. Let's say that the base rate is 20%. That means the expected value, which is nothing but just on an average, if somebody's trying to uh, take a loan, then what will be the uh, expected value of him get, getting the loan? And then for some reason, let's say his prediction jumps to 55%. And there are two features that are attributed to that. One is age, and the other is fee two, which is his profession, which is day trading. So 
what is happening here? With this v1 function, which is um, attributed to his age, which is 20, so he's a young guy. So his risk jumps by 15%. And now him being a day trader, which is a risky profession, it jumps to further 70%, right? So each of these feature attributions are raising the percentage of risk. And then there's some V3. And then that is a number of open accounts, which is one, which is again bad for him somehow. So that again raises it to 90%. So a combination. But, but you have to observe here one very important thing, that when I talk about V1, it is, there, there's, there's nothing but base rate before it, right? So it's conditionally dependent only on base rate. And then when I talk about V2, it has conditional dependence on fee zero, fee one. So with this form, what we're doing is, we're assuming sort of, uh, we, we are, so we are assuming conditional dependence. So there, there's a very important assumption here that all these features are first taken as independent from each other, and then finally we uh, calculate their joint probability distribution by, t by taking their dependencies one by one on each other. So let's say we have phi one, then we calculate it on the basis of its dependence on phi zero, and then phi two on the basis of dependence on phi naught and phi one, and so on. Okay, with this I'll move on to uh, phi four, which is capital gains, which means like he was trading and he had huge gains in the stock market. So that increased his chances of getting the loan now. So with that 90%, now it's dropped to 55%. That okay, now we think that 55% chance that we might be able to, uh, uh, he might, no. so this is actually 55% chance that he would be able to not pay the installment. So 45% chance that he might get the loan. So there's one more very important thing to consider here, that the orders matter a lot. If I would have exchanged these two features in terms of their position, Say we had had the knowledge that, okay, he's a day trader, and then we would have uh, came to the realization that his age is 20, then it would not have the same effect as with this sequence. Then you might ask, like, why? Why uh, this sort of uh, ordering is uh, so significant? And the answer to this is simple. The model itself is nonlinear, and these features come, uh, we, we assumed independence initially, but on the other side, we are calculating the joint distribution. So that's why when we calculate this feature fee, uh, fee1, let's say, then we take into consideration all the features that we have already calculated. So that's why, due to the nature of uh, the nonlinear nature of the model itself, and our assumptions of independence and taking the features in some particular sequence, we would have to uh, uh, the order actually starts mattering a lot. Now let's let's come back to the basics again. Like where does this all come from? So there's this guy uh, that introduced this idea from something called game theory. So in a financial market, a group of people that are par uh, part that that are participating in a corporate game, and we what what the objective of such a game is, we have to fairly distribute the payoff to all the players participating in the game. And for that, this, this guy Shapley, he came up with very clever techniques. And, and that's what is uh, very helpful in the machine learning world for explainability. And I'll show you how. So in this slide, uh, uh, what I'm trying to highlight is how his properties and the ideas that he came up with depending upon uh, the the game theory, how 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 they can be easily channelized to machine learning features, and the outputs. So consider, look at this uh, factor on the uh, right right hand side. So there's a payoff that is being calculated with some group where there's a player get, being excluded from that group, and then same payoff is getting calculated for the whole group, including that. Uh, that individual player. And then finally, we have like all such groups and all such players in those groups. And then for all such combinations, we average these values. And that's why we divide it with one by n factorial, right? 
So this is how uh, we kind of translate to this to the machine learning world, where players are features, and the payoff is the final model's real value prediction. So as you can see, it's, it's actually quite easy interpretation, right? How well it channelizes to uh, the machine learning world, it's, it's kind of very amazing to observe. But uh, keep in mind that it's not like that easy uh, for that to happen, for this, this form to, to take place. Shapley had to introduce a lot of properties. And there are two major properties that are, uh, that are very uh, important for discussing Shapley values further. First is local accuracy or additivity property, which just says that if there's a model output, then the initial base rate EFX that we take, if we subtract that base rate with the output, then it must, then it should be kept equal to the sum of all the fee values that we had. So all the feature attributions, you have to sum them up, and then you have to, you have to follow this as a rule of thumb that whenever you get the output and you subtract it with the base, then that will be equal to the to all that to the whole to the sum of all those input attribution feature, feature attributions. I mean, this is not necessary. It can break. You can break the form, but Shapley said that let's for uh, let's assume that this form should hold, and then you would later see why why he said that. So he came to the realization that if we keep these properties, then the final output depending upon all the inputs and outputs that you might have for some complicated model, your final output becomes, become, becomes consistent. So what I'm trying to say here is, uh, when you train a new explainability model, in that model, the, uh, the space, the, the, the space that, that it will have, the feature attribution space, that means the importances that it, it will assign to the features, that becomes very limited. So actually, there's only one possible solution that remains for those feature attributions when you consider these two properties. First, that I've already mentioned, additivity, and the second one is this con consistency property, where you say that, that let's say you retrain the model, and you give that model a feature, uh, and, that, and, and then you retrain, the, you tweak the model in such a way that the feature keeps on having larger impact on the outcome. So for every possible ordering that you take, because remember, I said the order matters, and I also told you how, but one, one thing is, is, is very, you need to be very careful with one thing here, that, uh, that if you don't have this consistency property, then this order will not mean to anything. So what I'm trying to say is, if you tweak the model so that one feature becomes important, and then you don't get the uh, the output in line with with that feature. Like, let's say the impact that is making in other combination. Let's say you change the order and starts uh, and it starts making impact, uh, which is like lesser uh, on the final output. And then in some other combination, it starts making output which has a larger impact. Then in the next subsequent combination, again there's less impact, and then large, and then less, and then larger. So if some kind of pattern like this occurs, then that means that there's, like whatever you are trying to do is garbage. Like there's no fixed answer that you can arrive to. So that's, that's what Shapley observed, that this order matters a lot, and for that, uh, that to hold, you have to have this consistency. And if you think a little more about this, this property also holds because of this property. So you might want to go and look into the original paper, and then you would actually realize how they are so interconnected. So for the machine learning people, they might be uh, who have seen these Shapley values, they might be used to seeing such a graph. So I wanted to keep it in the slide. So this, uh, this we will come to at last when I'll show you one of the projects on our uh, abacus.ai platform. And then using that project, I'll illustrate what are these Shapley values and how, can, how you can read them properly. With this, let's jump to Lime. So before starting with Lime, I would want to highlight why it was needed. So here, you have seen this, these properties. So they also form the basis of Lime. 
they're the same, they holds for Lime also. As I initially said, that the groundwork that I'm laying, it's applicable to Lime, as well as uh, the anchors that I'm gonna show. So, so try to think of what might happen if you have like so many of these features and then you're trying to compute all these features and you have like so many orders possible for all these features. So for such n factorial possible combinations, it will become very hard to compute even if you are just simply averaging them. So for that compute, I mean, it, it becomes an essentially an NP hard problem. So in order to tackle that computational complexity, uh, they, they, they produced something which is uh, which is like a like a car like a local kernel uh, and that local kernel along with some other parameters like regularization par parameters form the basis of translating into translating this all into a machine learning uh, problem where, where you can train a model and avoid that computational complexity but how we would do it I'll be explaining shortly so uh, before before I dive deeper into all those uh, uh, tra training uh, intricacies, I would like to first give you a basic idea of what Lime does. So this is our original classifier, any complex deep learning model, let's say. And then this line, this is actually the regressor explainer model that uh, that we are training for generating explanations for this original complex model. So what Lime does is, it is based on the assumption that the uh, that the po when we sample one point, then the nearer points to that sampled point is something that holds more importance as, as compared to the far away points. So with this assumption in mind, the reg the the linear regressor is trained. So uh, this is nothing but a binary vector. And for the purpose, and uh, th th that is the representation of these points. And you might think like why these binary vectors are there for, as a representation, you might have a single number. So it's nothing but for unstructured data modalities, you, you kind of vectorize these points into these binary vectors. You'll see how later. But for now, let's assume that these points are resembled by these binary vectors. So this line, this regressor new explainability model that we, are, that we have trained, is actually uh, it actually gives us uh, these kind of weights, these kind of feature importances, where the darker color means like it's more important, uh, it it has higher magnitude of effect for that particular input and output value that the complex model is giving, and for the blue one it's uh, it's just in the opposite direction. That means it has a positive uh, effect. If you take this as negative effect, then this will be the positive effect and the intensity of color is the magnitude of the effect itself. So I already told you what was missing, missing in CHAP, right? The computational complexity thing. So now I think it's a good time to dig deeper into the intricacies that I was, ta that I was talking about earlier on uh, how do we actually fit this linear regressor? How do we get this explanation out from the original complex model or for the original complex model? Okay, so you might be a little surprised. I mean, it, it's actually not that complicated as it looks. There are basically three hyperparameter stairs, loss function, local kernel, and regularizer. So until now, there's nothing complicated that I've introduced. It's a, it's a general form of a linear regressor where you're just trying to fit uh, a line, and you're trying to just find the optimal values, heuristically perhaps, for, three, for these three uh, hyperparameters. So let's let's try to dig a little more into what this loss function stands for and what this local kernel is, and what this re regularizer does. So, uh, because it's very important to to really understand these three in order to understand the inner workings of of a, such a regressor explainability model. So there's a formula uh, that that they discovered the guy who wrote the paper, uh, his name is Lundberg, Scott Lundberg. So he was the first author of that SHAP paper. And then he came up with this local kernel formulation where he basically said that uh, based on those two Shapley values that I just 
uh, mentioned, we would have a definitive one fixed answer. So a sort of consistent output. So if, if that's the case, then we should be able to train a classifier and should be able to approximate a kernel and reduce the loss function, right? In such a way that we reach to that final out uh, answer, right? So, so that's how he proceeded with this sort of formulation that let's keep uh, a loss function and a local kernel inside this loss, func loss function. And then for some cases where you might have uh, like a sparse model, let's keep a regularizer to make the, the model sparse. So that's the overall formulation that he came up with. And this local kernel formulation, that big formula I have not kept just to make it simple. But yeah, if somebody's really interested in diving deeper, then I would encourage them to look at that uh, Shapley, uh, Shap original paper from Scott Lundborg. So now uh, I've told you the, the inner workings of that model. H how do we actually train this linear regressor model for explainability? Let's also discuss on a higher level uh, uh, what it's actually doing. Like behind the scenes, we have already s uh, discussed what, what is happening. But like overall, how do we sample points and how do we make explanations? Let's discuss that too. So let's say I have any point sampled where uh, like this is coming. So this is the space for the original complex model. Uh, and then uh, that original model is giving you some sort of a classification results that, okay, this is one class, this is another class. And then now you, you're trying to generate explanations for why is it uh, like, uh, considering this point into that class and that this blue point into the other class, right? So what we do is we sample any random point, and then, as I already described, the line has a local consideration, and it is based on the assumption that this point automatically the near near points will hold more significance as compared to the far away points. So when we sample, we we sam uh, we assign them importances on the basis of their distance measure from the original point that we sampled. And then we keep on doing that. And then that's how, if you go back here, we try to reduce, like with, with, that, that, with that in place, we try to reduce this loss function. And the, uh, the local kernel formulation is already constant. And then we keep on doing that for every point. And then we finally have a trained classifier with fixed feature importance weights and that we can use to generate explanations. So that's how this overall uh, form looks like. OK, so I already mentioned uh, how, why we would, uh, how we would need to vectorize in case of unstructured modalities like that of text and images. So let's see that a little more how. So with text and images, the features are a little more complex. So to, in order to, to, to make to start attribution, feature attribution, sorry, what we do is convert these, uh, these data points in these two unstructured modalities into fixed binary vectors. Like here, you, you uh, converted that point into this vector and that point into this vector. So the, uh, the basis of this vector formulation is nothing, but, uh, but whether that point has something present or not. Right? So you might have a vocabulary, you might have words. So for that word, uh, if, if in, in some particular instance of input value, that word is present or not. So that will be the basis of such a text uh, data set. And for images, it will be something like a, like a presence or absence of pixel or some region of interest, some ROI that you have for that image. So now let's, let's discuss, like, like in the very beginning when I was talking about the utility of explainability in ML models. I mentioned briefly uh, that I would uh, illustrate how important it is for people, both uh, in the ML world, as well as people who are just uh, software developers and who have limited knowledge about machine learning. So let's consider this case where we are trying to predict whether uh, in the image we have a wolf or a husky, and they kind of look very same. <laughs> if somebody doesn't have the domain knowledge of the differences between a husky and a wolf, then they might really uh, get confused in that. And uh, as you guys might have already been 
very familiar with the process of Amazon Mechanical Turk, how they uh, hire uh, labelers and then how uh, their domain knowledge might be quite weak. So yeah, coming back to the topic. Here, if you see the explainability models output, you will notice that it's kind of looking at not the, or, not the animal itself, but the background, like the snow, in order to determine whether it's a wolf or a husky. So that becomes a problem here because it should ideally look at the animal, right? Not the snow. And neural networks are very famous for doing this. Like they try to figure out the shortest possible path to, to reach the conclusion. They just, they just want to minimize the loss function and then just get away with it. So that's why there's a lot, there are a lot of techniques for them to not do that, like regularization, like setting up the initial surface. But anyways, uh, coming back to the point here, in such cases, it becomes extremely critical and important to have explainability model trying to show us what the model might be doing inside, right? And then the labeler would be, the labeler would be able to decide whether to trust the model or not. Same with the movie, uh, same with the text modality, the explainability model might give you a weight for the word not and the word bad, and then you might be able to figure out whether whether uh, the model is doing justice in order to tell you, in, in telling you whether this is a this is overall a positive feedback from user for for such a for some movie or not, right? So as you see, it becomes quite handy to have explainability for complicated deep learning based models and other models like maybe as ensembles of several models. So for to, tr to trust a model to gain insight, you actually need such explainability models like Lime. And then, th then you can further improve your original complex model if it's not coming up to your expectations or if it's, if it's not doing something not desired. So with that, let's start with anchors. So Anchors is uh, fairly recent in the sense that relatively it came uh, later after uh, it came after uh, uh, Shap and then Lime and then it came in 2018. So the whole and sole question that this paper answers is: Should we really act on the explanations generated by the model? And if we should, then why? So that. Uh, so that line I kept because it really, the paper is really about answering this question. Okay, so before jumping into the intricacies again for how anchors work, we would look into some of the terminologies associated and some of the uh, metrics associated with, with uh, the working of anchors. So let's say we have a black box model, we have a, a model that is generating explanations, then we have a human, and then that human is probably maybe a labeler trying to do some labeling, or maybe a machine learning engineer trying to do some feature engineering, or anything else, right? So for him, if he thinks that what the mo if he thinks that he knows what the model uh, will do for some new prediction, then, then, then that becomes one metric that is called coverage. And then if he doesn't, then we will have a different coverage. So that metric that depends on what he thinks about what the model is going to predict for some newer outcome is called coverage in accordance with the authors of this paper. So there are two possible uh, choices that he might have. Either he, doesn't have re he really doesn't have any idea, or he, he really thinks that he knows what the model will do for some new data that might come in. So that is called uh, coverage, the probability of him thinking that he really knows and understands the model and its decisions. And the second metric, which is even more important and generally used, is precision. That given that he thinks he knows, what is the probability that he actually is right? So let's take an example from sentiment analysis in order to understand anchors a bit more. So let's say we have mm, this sentence and then a outcome from the complex model, which is like, okay, it's positive, the movie is not bad. And then there's an explainability model that gives such explanation, such feature importance to the words, to individual words in this review. Uh, and for this case, this might say that the movie is not very good, and it might have different explainability uh, uh, criteria. 
So in Lime, as we already saw, that it, it has local preference. So it sees all these input outputs combinations locally. And then if you see, if, if, you, if you try to increase your reach and consider uh, the, out, the, the outcomes more globally, then you would come to this realization that they're kind of contradicting and confusing the person who is, who is checking the final outcome of the model. So he might think like, what is the weight that actually this not words hold altogether? And then he might settle with the fact that, okay, these, uh, these explanations are dependent upon each individual input output values, as I already told you, that we don't see we don't see every input and output, we actually see them one by one. So he might settle for that, okay, for this I, I see this importance, uh, importance explanation, for this statement I see them. But then overall he would never be able to, to, to come up with a reasonable idea of each individual feature importance in his mind. So that is one problem that was with Lime. And with anchors, that, get, that gets quite uh, resolved. Because in anchors, what they do is, they, 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 f they formulate some anchor which acts globally, which means that when you will have a review, the meaning of that anchor will never change. The importance value that is given to that anchor will always remain, co remain constant. So that's where anchor, anchor shines. So with that, let's dive a little deeper into, into how, how actually they train an anchor. How do they reach to the conclusion that uh, we should take those two words as anchors and not the other 9,000 words or whatever vocabulary size you might have. So, so there's some data, some sample point. There's an outcome from this complex black box model. And let's say you have a potential anchor, this, for that sample. And then now, your hypothesis is for a given anchor that you have chosen, you might have some precision value, which here they took as 95% or greater. And then if it's not holding, then either you sample more anchors, or you change the model itself, or you do something else, which is maybe like sample different data point, right? So three possible combinations that you might have, three choices. So with this, uh, let's try to dig into like uh, what happens when we uh, when we have such choices. So initially, we have like a 50% probability with each random anchor that we might have chosen. Like this movie is not bad. So we have we are going through uh, uh, them one by one, anchoring them, and trying to see like uh, what is the probability distribution for uh, for uh, when we take this as anchor. Then what is the feature importance? What is the probability distribution for the feature importance? right, of the outcome. Like how much the outcome depends on this individual word being an anchor. So initially it's just garbage 50-50. But then when you start sampling a lot of points, you get, you get to the realization that the, that the points that are really important, this, this graph starts shifting and you start getting a distribution which is closer to 95%, like here. So this is not important. So it shifts kind of low as you sample more and more points and try to train this uh, regressor, regressing model with this anchor. And then again, it shifted more as you sample more and more points or you change the model. One of those three choices that I mentioned earlier. Here. And then finally, they came up with this clever tactic where they fused that most important word with all the other words to see if something can give them more probability, like higher than 95%, which was their initial hypothesis. So they finally keep sampling, keep going through the whole data, and then finally for one, so note that every probability here has reached like more than 80% because of the inclusion of not. Because with not is already important, so anything after that will only add on to it. And then Finally, this bad and not gives them a precision of more than 95%. So this, they cho choose it as an anchor. So this is how like the training looks like. So they try to sample, and then uh, they, tr they try to go through all these combinations, and then uh, they use reinforcement learning to, to like minimize that loss and 
raise the precision to 95% coming up with the final anchor. So again, I would encourage you how they sample, how they use reinforcement learning, the multi-arm multi bandit uh, uh, technique that they have used. Uh, like, uh, I would really suggest you to read the paper if you're really interested. It's, it's quite clever. Now, one, uh, one thing before moving on to the project uh, on our platform, the significance of good explanations. So in the same paper, Anchors, they discussed the significance of using Anchors um, on like the final uh, Amazon mechanical torquers while labeling some, uh, uh, some data set. So with no explanations, they kind of made, a, they kind of predicted 53.42 uh, percent times. With Lime 67, with Anchors, it kind of reduced. So the interesting thing here is, now that they know the explanations coming from Anchors, which is like a global explanation being very accurate, giving them a high precision, they kind of take it for granted that, oh, now we know the inner working of models, so they kind of don't even bother predicting. So that's why the percentage is quite lost. So that sh actually shows that they're fairly confident that they know what the model is doing. So it's quite interesting study. You might want to look into it, like time per prediction. So they, they took very less time in order to understand the model and come up with the right labels. And they were correct for 97% of the times in that process. So Anchors is actually quite useful in this regards, data labeling. OK, now this Shapley diagram. ML engineers, <laughs> I would, I, I would want to discuss this Shapley diagram further using our platform. So let's go to our platform real quick. So this is how our console looks like. I've logged into my organization. I've created several projects. Let's take this life expectancy regression predictive model. So we have a use case, predictive modeling. And there you can train your regressor and classifiers. So in this problem, we are regressing and trying to calculate life expectancy giving, given some demographics data. So this is a data set that is open to all on Kaggle. So you might want to look into it if you're interested to train such a model. Like with respect to the country, its status, and its socioeconomic factors, how the life expectancy in that country uh, changes. So we are trying to like train a model to predict uh, this life expectancy. And then also, we are trying to uh, get the benefit from the Shapley values and seeing what is the feature that is more, more important. So I've already trained a model. And these are the metrics for the model. This is the dashboard. I've already deployed the model, which is active. So I'll go to the dashboard. OK. So we have our Shapley predictions. So let's just take some interesting values to understand how these Shap values work and what they mean, actually, what these numbers mean. So let's take this, life expectancy 72.8. So this is going to populate with that data point. OK, so here we have such a graph. These are the top 10, 15 features that are contributing to this result. So remember, I told you that every input value, so these feature importances, they change with input values. So for every data row, data point, you will have a different Shapley values, right? And that makes sense, right? Because for every such data point, the, 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 the kind of explanations that you might have will change, right? Some features in some cases are more important, while some other features in some other cases might be more important, right? Like uh, income composition, which is like the whole family income, is contributing a lot for the increase in life expectancy, which is just, which is quite reasonable, right? Uh, country, status, adult mortality, 166. So it's 0.11. Yes, it is positively contributing. OK. So as we can see, that the explanations are coming out to be quite reasonable here. So uh, one interesting thing to note here, column HIV AIDS, it's positively contributing. So you might wonder why. How is it increasing life expectancy, right? But the devil is in the detail. If you look carefully, then you would notice that the value of this factor is quite low for that country. If you would go and look, that is quite low. And that's why, uh, yep, 
And that's why it is contributing positively. So for some other data point, that might be high, so it would, it would start contributing negatively. So let's actually take some other data point. I think this is quite low. Let's take this. See, here, most of the factors are actually contributing negatively because the life expectancy is low and they're bound to uh, uh, they're bound to like have negative feature importances, right? So adult mortality is less. AIDS, as I already told you, is contributing negatively here. It's high. So I think you get the idea, right? How these explanations are very critical and important in order to understand the inner workings of the model and and checking, cross-verifying the generalization capability of this sort of uh, model, right? So, so yeah, I would encourage you guys to to like train your models on our platform. It's free and open to all. You can just uh, request an access to this platform, train your model regression, classification, forecasting, recommendation. We support a lot of use cases. And then uh, uh, if you face any problem, you are most welcome to take help from me or reach our um, ML experts. And uh, yep, I would quickly also want to show you the model showcase, something really cool that we have developed here. So I think this is another interesting way of sharing your, your ML skills with the community. So you can train a model and then share with the community here. And we are also introducing an editor spec. That means every week we would be choosing one beautiful model, well-performing model, and we'll kind of reward that model and feature that on our showcase. Uh, yep. One last thing before uh, handing it to Yash that I would want to show you, this documentation. So for using our platform, I mean, it's quite intuitive and easy to use. But if you get stuck or if you kind of, because everybody is coming from different backgrounds, they might have different uh, level of ML expertise. So you might be able to like uh, go through our documentation and then uh, unstuck yourself. So with that, I would. Uh, so I would say goodbye for now, and I would uh, say that thank you very much for uh, being with me, and uh, I hope that you would read more on explainability and try to contribute positively to the field itself. So with that, goodbye, and I'll hand over to Yash. He will be taking over debiasing. Okay. Hello, can can you hear me? Just just wanted to check in that you can hear me. Um, I'll give it I'll give it a couple of seconds to. All right, cool. So, thank you, Ankit, for that great talk. My name is Yar Sabani. I am a research scientist at Abacus.ai, and today I'll be talking about post hoc debiasing methods. So let's get started. As machine learning increasingly affects decisions in domains protected by anti-discrimination law, there is much interest in algorithmically measuring and ensuring fairness in domains such as advertising, credit, employment, education, and criminal justice. Machine learning could help obtain more accurate predictions in these domains, but its, eff but its effect on existing biases is not well understood. In May 2014, the Obama administration's Big Data Workshop, or sorry, Big Data Working Group released a report arguing that discrimination can sometimes be the inadvertent outcome of the way big data technologies are structured and used. <clears throat> the news organization ProPublica released a report in 2016 showing that machine learning algorithms were particularly likely to falsely flag black defendants as future criminals wrongly labeling them this way at almost twice the rate as white defendants, and that white defendants were mislabeled as low risk more often than black defendants. Here we see an example of bias in the system, in, in this slide here. Um, a, a prison computer program trained to classify how likely an offender is to commit a future crime made an error by classifying a white man, Vernon Prater, as having a lower risk of repeating an offense despite more serious and more numerous prior offenses than the black woman, Brisha Borden, who was classified as a high risk. 
There are many other such examples of bias on the ProPublica report linked in the reference slide at the end. Before we start learning how to de-bias machine learning models, let's take a step back and look at the big picture. We're going to consider the supervised binary classification task for the remainder of this talk. There are several examples of binary classification tasks that may lead to biased ML algorithms. Some examples off the top of my head are criminal recidivism, advertisement targeting, and loan approval. The way we usually tackle such binary classification tasks is to prepare a data set we want to train and evaluate our model with. We usually shuffle the rows of the, of the data set so they're closer to IID. We then partition the data set into a train, validation, and test sets. Each row in the data set represents an instance that we want to classify. In this example, each instance contains a features, features about a person, including race and age, among others. We then come up with a model to predict the desired label. In this case, we are using a neural network, indicated by the blue, bo blue boxes with squiggly lines between them. Right there. Um, the neural network processes the features of the instance and comes up with a prediction for whether the person should get a positive or negative label. A loss function is then used to compare the predicted score to the actual score provided by the data set. Based on the amount of loss in the model, an error gradient is backpropagated through a network to update the weights so the model achieves a lower loss in the next iteration. We usually train the model like this on the entire training set for several epochs. After each epoch, we evaluate the model loss on the validation set that the model is not trained on. Once the loss of the, once the, loss of the model on the validation set starts to go up, we stop training the model. So we stop training the model once we reach this point around here. Um, after training is complete, we usually evaluate how well the model performs on the test set using statistics from a confusion matrix. The confusion matrix compares the predicted classifications to the true classifications for the test set and tallies the errors and correct classifications in a two by two table as shown here. Based on the results of this matrix, we can then calculate other measures of performance like accuracy, precision, recall, F1 score, etc. So far, we have not said anything about bias. To introduce bias, we need to demarcate one of the input features as a protected variable. The protected variable is usually a binary label identifying a person as a member of a privileged or unprivileged group. These labels are abstract and can represent any group we want to predict. Protect, sorry. Everything we have talked about so far focuses on minimizing the false positives and false negatives for the entire data set. However, when trying to debias a model, we are instead focusing on making the confusion matrix for the unprivileged class as close to the confusion matrix for the privileged class as possible. In other words, we want the true positive and false positive rates for both groups to be as close to each other as possible. In order to do this, we introduce three possible bias measures we might want to optimize for. The first one, SPD, or statistical parity difference, is the most basic of these measures. It measures the difference between the likelihood of the model uh, labeling an instance as positive if they are in a privileged group and the model labeling an instance as positive if they're in the um, privileged group. So the comparisons between unprivileged, where A is equal to zero is unprivileged, and A is equal to one here is privileged. Essentially, this measure tries to make sure that the model is not giving an advantage to the privileged group. So here, we're just trying to make sure that the models are, the, the model is able to give positive predictions equally to the unprivileged and privileged groups. The second measure, EOD, or equalized op equal opportunity difference, measures the difference between the true positive rates of the two protected groups. The intuition behind this measure is to make the true positive rates and not just the number of positive predictions as close to each other as, pos as possible. And finally, we have AOD, or average odds difference, that measures the average difference between the false positive rates, the false positive rates difference, and the true positive rates difference. This essentially measures the average difference between the entire confusion matrix matrices. Since the true negative rates and the false negative rates can easily be found using the false positive and true positive rates respectively. Note that all these bias measures are non-differentiable, so we can't perform classical 
classic back propagation using these measures directly. Once we choose a measure, well, once we choose a, choose a bias measure that we want to use, we have to come up with an objective function that trades off between the bias measure and the performance loss. We notate this objective with phi and parameterize the bias measure using mu and the loss function with script L. We also have a we also have a trade-off parameter lambda that allows us to interpolate between the bias and the loss. So here we're trying to minimize the absolute bias and we're also trying to maximize loss. So one minus the loss is um, minimizing the inverse of the loss or maximize it. And so basically what we try to do is get better accuracy and worse and, and have um, low bias. In order to minimize the, um, so in order to minimize the bias of the model, the first thing that comes to mind is to simply remove the protected variable from the data set. However, for instance, sorry, so if, if we remove the protected variable from the data set, um, that would be like one, removing the race feature from the data set. We could potentially just restrict access, access to that feature. However, this doesn't work too well in practice. This is because usually there are several other features that may be correlated with the protected variable. If the relationship between the desired label and the protected variable is strong enough, then the model may learn to impute the missing protected variable from the rest of the features. For example, in this joint plot, we can see that the features are all relatively correlated to each other. Even if we are, even if we were to drop one of the features, it's likely that the model could impute the value of that feature from the rest of the data. One example of how this may work in practice is the zip code of a person could be used to identify their race, a practice called reverse redlining. This practice has been used to target ra racial minorities for predatory lending schemes to charge them more than the price for people living in more privileged areas. Since a trivial solution turns out to be a bust, we need to come up with other way, an, another way of, to debias our models. Here we find three categories of debiasing algorithms, pre-processing, in-processing, and post-processing algorithms. I'll go over the pre-processing and in-processing algorithms briefly to, dis, to, put, to add some context, but for the remainder of this talk, we'll, we will be focusing on the post-processing algorithms. The, the pre-processing debiasing algorithms do not work with the model. They usually use data augmentation techniques and various sampling methods to change the data set to make it less biased. If the, if the data set is less biased, it is likely that the model trained on the data set will also be less biased. In processing debiasing algorithms, on the other hand, modify the model or the way that the model is trained in order to achieve a lower bias. These methods tend to change the way the model is trained to maximize performance without suffering from bias. Finally, post-processing techniques work by taking a pre-trained model and making modifications to the model on the basis of a held out validation set in order to create a fairer model. We focus on post-processing techniques here because this is a very common situation for deep learning. Usually we are given a pre-trained model and only a small number of data examples to fine tune the model with. This is the case for many computer vision and natural language tasks. The original model may not have being trained, the, the original model may not have been trained using any of the pre-processing or in-processing algorithms that we talked about before. Furthermore, we may not have access to the resources to train this model from scratch again. This is where post-processing debiasing comes in. Using this technique, we can fine-tune the previously trained model to, uh, we can fine-tune the previously trained model weights to optimize for our objective. The first post-processing method we will discuss is the classic post-processing algorithms. There are three particular algorithms within this class, ROC, or reject option classification, equalized odds, and calibrated equalized odds. All three of these algorithms use the output from the model and make changes to the classification deci decisions close to the separating hyperplane boundary. For instance, here we see two classification classes, boxes and circles, as well as hy a hyperplane separating them. The classic post-processing techniques shuffle around the data points close to the hyperplane boundary to produce a more fair classification. The first, so while, while classic post-processing algorithms can work with any black box classifier, since they do not rely on the model specifications, the following post-hoc methods make the assumption that we are debiasing a neural network. 
The first post hoc method is the random post hoc debiasing algorithm. In this algorithm, we take a pre-trained model and perturb the weights of the model slightly using samples from a Gaussian distribution. Making small multiplicative changes to the weight does not change the model much, but searches in the vicinity of the optimal weight space to identify a weight vector that might be able to achieve a similar loss performance without being as biased. This essentially boils down to a single step of an evolutionary algorithm. In practice, this method is easy to implement and works relatively well. The second post hoc method is the layer wise post hoc debiasing. In this method, in, in this technique, we iteratively go through each layer of the network and identify which layer is most responsible for the bias. We then apply a black box optimization technique on the layer to minimize that loss. The black box technique we use in the experiments is gradient boosted regression trees, but any black box optimizer would work here. The final post hoc algorithm that we'll be considering is the adversarial post hoc debiasing algorithm. This model is inspired by the GAN model from Goodfellow et al. In this model, we use the, the pre-trained model as the base model and alternate between updating the weights of the model to minimize the performance loss and use a separate critic architecture to predict the bias of the model on a batch of examples. By using a critic to predict the bias of the ba base model, we can convert the non-differentiable bias measure to a differentiable one through the critic. We can then use the base model results with the critic results to optimize for the objective function directly using backpropagation. On this slide, we see the results of the experiment using all the post-processing debiasing algorithms we've discussed here on four tabular data sets. Each bar here represents an algorithm. Each cluster of bars represents one of the data sets, and each graph is a bias measure. So this is statistical parity difference. This is average odds difference. This is equal opportunity difference. The lower is better here. So the, the scores that have the lowest like objective are, are the ones that are, are the models that are, are performing the best. We, we can also see a Pareto plot of how each model performs in trading off accuracy versus bias. As you can see, the post hoc methods, those are like the random adversarial and layer wise, all do better on all the data sets than the default than, than the default model, and they often beat the classical the classical post processing methods. Finally, we also tested our model on our on a celebrity image data set, where we tried to make a model that classifies whether a celebrity is smiling or not, more fair with respect to the race of this celebrity. As we can see, the postdoc technique works well here to improve the probability that a black person is considered smiling. In conclusion, we have seen how debiasing ML models is is an important goal for our society. We explain why trivia we explain why trivial methods do not work and talked about a few alternative solutions. We mainly focused on post-processing techniques that rely on a pre-trained model and modify the model to create a more fair estimator. Hopefully, these techniques will allow us to take advantage of the performance gains we can achieve with machine learning without having the algorithm suffer from major bias. If you want more information on this topic, feel free to check out our paper and our blog post, and also some of the other references provided in the last two slides. Thank you.